This is my skull. There are many like it, but this one is mine. <laughs> Without me, Paul Schreier is useless. That's true. Without Paul Schreier, I am useless. <laughs> You're useless with Paul Schreier. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Switch on. Welcome to me on. Howard. There, there wasn't a last time. It's the first one. Oh. Woo! Next time, we're going to talk about this first one, and we'll be like, it was so much better than this one. Back in the old days, PowerCon was amazing. Yeah, you guys are in at the ground floor of this amazing event. And so next year, when it's like packed with thousands of people, you'll be like, uh, I fondly remember the early years. <laughs> In the old days, the power come was actually just in the hotel rooms with the actors. I mean, like, their rooms. Like, you sat on the bed, and, hi, how are you doing? But you're the guy from Power Rangers, right? No, I, I really, I'm loving England because the coffee here is amazing. Because, look, um, it comes with candy. <laughs> you didn't know that. You should check your coffees. You'll find a sucker. <laughs> Why are you looking at me when you say sucker? I just thought of you. Just, uh, just the image of you popped into my head. <laughs> oh, it's a skull! Oh, it's a skull! Oh, I've got a skull in my head! Wait a minute. Hey, Connor, you got a front row seat, bro. What you doing? Alright, sitting. Okay, so what do you people want to talk about? What are we talking about here? Yeah, what this is talking? weird. We've never had it in this kind of like convention style where everyone's got like a little table. So like you guys can like sit around the table and completely ignore us. <laughs> And we suddenly don't exist. Like, guys, guys. Um, I don't know about you, but I didn't really go to my senior prom. This kind of reminds me of a prom. Yeah. Now, if they would drop off some really bad chicken, that would be a prom. <laughs> Does that make us the king and queen? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> yep, we are the king and queen. How you doing? Uh, how you doing? I'm doing great. I'm the king. It's good to be the queen, too. I gotta tell you what. Uh, I could be a queen much better than another queen. You guys got a queen? So, hey, yeah, they, they, they already have one. Yeah? What's she like? Is she short? I, I wonder when people meet the queen, do they say, you look taller on TV? Yeah, and she is kind of a tiny woman, right? She's small. She ain't no queen mom. I'll tell you what. That was a queen. But what do you mean? Well, I mean, the queen mom was also technically a queen. Uh, and the queen now is not the queen mom. That's a different person. The queen's mom is the queen mom. Was. But no longer is. That's very complicated. It really, really is. And royalty is very complicated. You see, Paul, the line you know is like me. <laughs> Go on. Go on. Please. You can trace yourself back to the Stuart Kings. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Bueller. Okay, I'm going to quiz you. How many King Jameses were there? Seven. Two! You hear that? Right here in the front. Two. Give them a round of applause. You're correct, Connor. However, we also would have accepted seven if you're Scottish. kings. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Our family was nearly kings of Scotland. Nearly kings of Scotland. How are you nearly king? Like you almost killed the guy, you're like, like... <laughs> I almost got to cry. <laughs> no, now I'm wearing two hats. No, our family... So you know, they, so they told us, you guys, you guys have a, you have a talk. Yeah, it's they called it a talk. It's a talk. So, so I thought it was kind of a chat show or something. I remember in London Film and Comic Con, we had David, who is in a tuxedo, and he was very demure, and he asked us really wonderful questions. But here we've been cast adrift on our own, helpless. They basically give you a cattle prod, they go, dance, monkey, dance. Be funny. <laughs> okay, so. All right, so why don't we like go around? I mean, are we supposed to talk? We're supposed to ask, have them ask us questions. If you want to ask us questions, you don't have to. We'll just keep talking like this. We're gonna keep quizzing you guys like on all the kings and queens of England. You know what? We we should we should just talk about the Power Rangers and not ourselves. All right. So you know, if if you were to grab every Power Ranger, they would arrest you. <laughs> 
if you were to grab them. I need to take the losses because that's just open. Just get that soldier. Just that. Open. How many buses would you need to transport all of the Power Rangers? So let's see. Go on, Connor. Uh, what is it? Is it candy? Don't yes, say candy from a strange boy. Oh. Yes, I. No, thank you, Connor. It's all right. No, thank you. I think what I could really use is a piece of fruit and a treadmill, but it's fine. <laughs> So, you know, we always joke, you know, people always say, uh, wouldn't you guys like to be Power Rangers? Wouldn't you really, you know, get, like to get the spandex and the helmet? And the answer is no. How, going back to the previous thing, one of the previous things he said, first of all, how many Power Rangers are there? Like, 85? There's a lot. How many bulking skulls are there? That's right. That's right, there's one bulk and skull. Yeah, and there's not, there, and there's, there's no aging, there's no aging Japanese guy that used to be my character. Uh, there's an aging Jewish guy that used to be my character. Except for you. Don't forget Spike. Japanese version of Bowie the Samurai, it seems they got the voice of you. But they, well, they, yeah, they did, they did air it over there. And, and I, I picture the Japanese watching the American version of the show with some sort of horror on their face. It was like, I like it. You know, what are they, I mean, that's too meta, isn't it? That's like, that's, well, and, and the Japanese meta. version, has anyone actually seen the original Japanese one? Yeah. Yeah, it's like a horror movie. Can you do the skull lock? Uh, I don't know how to do the skull lock. You know, and let, let me explain that. It's not Jason being obstinate. It's you know when you're when you're a young person, your your voice is is a is a lilting, <laughs> wonderful instrument. And as you get older and more angry, your voice what the hell is that angry, supposed to be? Your voice and your body changes into a shadow of its former self. I am just as good as I ever was. I don't need that laugh anymore to get validation, Paul Schreier! You want me to laugh? Oh. <laughs> How's that for your laugh? He's not angry at all. He's not angry. You know, I, I'm sure some of you have done a lot, a lot of your university, right? But Jason, he has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, which he has yet to pay back to the U.S. government. And, <laughs> And they all he got in return was a tiny piece of paper, and at the end of his name it says, <laughs> PhD. PhD. Big deal. Big so, so, deal. The, so the answer is the deal with the laugh is that that was like a 17 year old Narvi yeah. who could do that laugh. And even back then, it was a whole diaphragmatic kind of exercise for him to do it. It was never an easy thing to do. And oh, I still hear one squeak out of him occasionally, but you know, he's, he's kind of like an athlete that's past his prime, if you know all the way. Actually, this is the truth, so jump, so, because I, it, it's always been hard for me to do it standing still. Okay, like Paul said, it, it really is all that stuff. But we were doing that acting exercise yeah, in, in, um, in um, New Orleans, yeah. and it just so happened that it slipped out perfectly. That was the one time I was able to do it perfectly in the past 10 years. And that's because we were jumping around and we were doing, we did, instead of a panel, we decided that we were going to do an acting class. And so we got everyone in a big circle around us. It was awesome. Yeah. And then Walter dropped in. Yeah. And we did something and then it just fit. So if I were to try to do it right now, you'd be like, yeah, that, 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 you old bastard. <laughs> Please. <laughs> hey, doesn't it sound like an old lady? <laughs> Doesn't it sound like a chihuahua? <laughs> like an old chihuahua. I just had dirt come out. Put it, put Next! Any other questions? Uh, we, oh, right here. Uh, speaking of like, the, the going to a press conference and stuff, how was the atmosphere for the new rangers coming in? Like, because you were all so young, I guess you were all close knit. Austin uh, and everyone leaving so quick. How was the environment? Was it kind of clicky? You know, new people coming in, or I don't think so. I don't think it was clicky. Well, I was their acting coach when when the new cast started, when the three new kids came in, and and so for me, I felt uh, uh, some responsibility, you know, to them because I wanted to help them look as relaxed as possible on screen. Because you know, when you get an acting job. You're so petrified, frankly, that you're not going to do well. 
that it, that, you know, that fear is the biggest obstacle to performing. It is the only obstacle. Like some of you, I'm sure, have a fear of speaking in public, right, or a little bit shy. That fear is overriding, and it can crush your soul. And and only by facing fear and, and finding ways like rehearsing a lot and really practicing can you find a quiet space inside to be able to perform uh, well and, and, and like what you're doing. And so, you know, they were so worried about performing well that they, there were no clicks. You know, we, you know, we, we have this, the syndrome of like troops in a trench, you know, we all got our boots in the same mud and let's charge on. You know? Well, and it's also, I mean, it was also a, a very different feel when the first group of people came in because it was nothing, it was an acting gig and everyone was so eager and happy to be there. Um, and years down the line, I think when people came in, it was a giant commodity, and they knew it as that. So the attitude was different, not in a bad way, it was, it was just you were stepping on to something that had been built again, you know? So that was, that was a very marked difference. You know, the, the, the Narvi and I got to play the coolest roles in the history of acting, in our opinion. So because we love Laurel Hardy, Gilligan Skipper, and Abbott and Costello, and so the chance to get to do that, and really, if you think about it, when the Power Rangers are on screen, they line them up like popsicles in a fridge. <laughs> and then one of them talks, and the other one goes, yeah, guys, yeah, let's go. And then they all run off together. It's like, no, Jason and I, at least we got a two shot. We never have like a five or six shot. That's right. <laughs> all right, next. Yeah, there was someone back there. There we go. Who's your favorite ranger for the whole entire series of all the 20 years of Power Rangers? That's a really good question, Ash. Hmm. Uh, hmm. Ranger or actor? You said ranger, what do you mean? Ranger. Well, I just want to know what the character name or if I'm doing the, like, you know. You said ranger. 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 Uh, don't worry, we can't be here. Five bucks. <laughs> uh, green ranger dragons are. Yeah, that was a really cool character. Yeah, totally. Yeah, you know the Green Ranger was in the high school band. <laughs> Next! Right over there. Hi. Hi! Oh! My question is from uh, Paul. <laughs> what was your um, favorite Christmas episode? Yeah. Well, yeah, I know. I did quite a few of them, actually. Yeah. Um, I, I really liked the one from Samurai because I thought that it was the situation was very well conceived. The scene was well constructed. The only thing that was missing was a giant nose. <laughs> so, um, the only thing that would have really made that made it perfect would if Jason would have been in it. So, but I did have Spike, which is like Skull Light. <laughs> you know? He's got that kind of, he's there, but he's got a kind of saccharine aftertaste. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, you, you... Artificial sweetener. <laughs> Felix is artificially sweet? He is, he oh. is, totally. Oh. It was pretty funny, Felix, Felix uh, showed up to the Power Morphicon in Los Angeles, and, and I, I was on vacation, so I couldn't go. And Jason and he did a panel, and apparently it was like, Battle of the Wills, and I, I think Jason kind of was a little hard on him. I break things and people. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, PhD acting professor, like that, how do you even compete with that? Well, it was funny, because uh, in, in particular what happened, uh, poor, this is why poor Felix was a bit of, uh, had a bit of an disadvantage. The previous Power Morphicon, Paulie and I broke the Power Morphicon. Yes, because of pies. Yes. Oh. We did a demo of pie throwing, and someone had thrown a pie, and it went kind of just across Polly Broadside, and all up against the wall. Like, it did like $8,000 worth of damage in one pie throw. So people were just, for the next two years, Foaming, you know, foaming at the mouth to see how we were going to ruin the next one. And so I walk in and I see everyone out there in the audience, and there's like three times as many of them as there are of you, and they look like like people had a gladiatorial game and they want blood. <laughs> Except they were all wearing plastic bags. Yeah, <laughs> they were all wearing plastic bags. So the very first thing I did is I went, oh, I told you, don't <laughs> play the <laughs> I 
know, so I think you get the idea. Felix just was not prepared for the level of commitment that Jason has. Clearly. And I told you Jason breaks microphones all the time. Microphones are like my natural enemy. But I'm so monkey in the trees. No, oh, it, it doesn't sound. Like, it doesn't sound like it's working. Nope. No, it's working fine. So what I said. <laughs> All right, who's got a question, you guys? I don't know. Who, how about you? How about you? I don't know, man. You know, we did like 400 episodes of Power Rangers, so it's very difficult. But I will tell you this: when we would get the scripts, of course, we would very quickly look through to find our lines. <laughs> we could kind of assume what was going to be the other parts because it was the same every episode. <laughs> so we just wouldn't really read it. And then after a while, they stopped writing stuff for Bulk and Skull. They would just say, Bulk and Skull do something funny. <laughs> so I basically didn't even really need to read the scripts at all. <coughs> so we would show up, and then we would do something funny. And if you do that for a number of years, pretty soon you kind of forget what you did. And so even today, I'll be on Netflix or you know, I'll, I'll watch something, and I'm like, wow, that is me. But I don't remember doing that. <laughs> But that's really funny, though. Yeah, <laughs> so, it's weird. You know, there's a, there's a ton of really good bits. I don't know. What, what, I, I think the funniest, I, I shouldn't say the funniest, but the one that sticks out today because someone brought it up, was the episode where we got our heads shaved and we had to look at each other and scream. <laughs> because that was legitimately funny. Paulie and I used to pride ourselves on one and done. Boom. Get it in the can. We're done. Right there, we're in a second take. We don't need to. But that one took us like 15 takes. Because we looked at each other. Because they, they turned us around on the barber chairs. And we go, and we look at each other's heads, and then we look at the mirror and go, ah! and we look at the other guy and go, oh my god, I must look as terrible as him. Ah! But every time we look at each other, we look, you're so ugly. You were dying. <laughs> you were dying. Oh, and you were ugly. You <laughs> just, you were, your head is the weirdest shape. It is weird. It was so funny, too, because it's the only time I went to the producers and say, please, don't make me do this. Because they, I knew how ugly my head was. They were going to have me shave it, and I just broke it up with my girlfriend, which meant that I was out hunting for girls, and I had that looking like that. <laughs> I'm 20 years old. Yeah, you look like it. You know, at least they didn't shave it all the way up. You look like an extra from Top Gun or something. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> But you know, fortunately for me, when I shaved my head on the series, I immediately got some extra acting work as one of the alien eggs in the movie Aliens. <laughs> it just kind of opens, you know, when the face hunter comes out. Well, that's pretty hard, mate. So you guys are sitting down doing a zap, and there's a monster attack in the city, and you think it's like, oh, wow. Yeah, welcome to my world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was there any other Power Ranger that you wanted to be a part of? I'm sorry, say it again? Was there any other Power Ranger product that you wanted to be a part of? You know, working for the Power Rangers is like working for the CIA. <laughs> you think that you're done, and you don't do that anymore. And then they call with one last mission. <laughs> over and over. So I, you know, I, I swear, I thought that I'd been done with the Power Rangers so many times, and invariably, I get called and they reactivate me like a sleeper cell. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> oh, really? Um, oh, wait. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Totally. Thanks. How different was the relationship between Bulk and Skull and then Bulk and Spike in Samurai? Well, it's definitely different because it was more parochial and more parental. I mean, that was the, that was a major difference for me playing the character who reprised the role is that I, I mean, I'm already a moron, but now I had to like be parental with an idiot, you know. So, so it was it was a challenge. Parental with an idiot. Yeah. I, I would like to get that as, as a T-shirt. Parental with an idiot. You <laughs> walk around my door, son. I know, but it'll be years before your son Jack will even know what that means. That's true. Are you saying because he's an idiot? <laughs> oh. Yes, Papa. <laughs> My son is 34, by the way, so he almost knows how to read any day now. All right, next. 
I find your lack of chin disturbing. <laughs> I have no chin. I do not have a budget for a chin. What, we could get a budget increase from Showmasters. We could get you a chin. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Who's got a question, guys? Connor. Who's your favorite fat guy? Paul. Oh. <laughs> oh, that hurts. Oh, I, I like uh, the 60 foot bulk. We never had that one, Paul. That was in your dreams. Oh. Yeah. We really, really, really wanted to do an episode where Paul was just walking down the street of Angel Grove, you know, the giant fake building. <laughs> uh, I think we actually wrote one of those episodes. Yeah. Uh, never happened. I just wanted to destroy Tokyo, really. <laughs> you know, the construction industry in Angel Grove, it's booming. <laughs> Just on fire. I think that's how Skull became rich. By selling insurance. Hey, you, you've never told this before. This is the first time you're publicly telling us. Oh, how, how I think Skull became yeah. rich? Yeah, I think, you know, Sam Raimi shows up in the limo. You know. Yeah, I think that he was like the world's greatest risk assessor because he was so traumatized by these monsters always. Like, the people have been like, um, we're going to build this building here. What do you think there, Eugene Skull? like, it's going to fall down and we're going to die! I'm like, oh, he's a genius. It did. I didn't know this. <laughs> he's the only guy. His cowardice is the thing. So they just keep pushing money at Do you think it's going to work? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to burn down and people are going to die! Skullovich Industries. Because that's the way it goes. <laughs> So he just let you into his little private acting world because that was the <laughs> That was it. We kept saying, how is Skull filthy rich? They never explain it. They and like in fact the script itself insinuated that somehow there was a chasm like it was awkward between Bulk and Skull that they hadn't seen each other in 20 yeah. years, even though I'm like, here's my kid. Take him. <laughs> <laughs> and then we show up and we're like, do I know you? Totally. Are you the guy? Are you the guy? Does this belong to you? I vaguely remember you, and now you should get in your car and drive away. <laughs> Not quite 20 years, yeah. It's true. It's like 15. Yeah, next. When uh, Toe went, what happened to Lieutenant Stone? Oh, yeah. We, we always wonder. So, so the actor that played Lieutenant Stone was named Greg Bullock. But because I could never remember his name, I always called him Doug. <laughs> And so after a while, we joked about this so many times that we didn't work with him every day. So we're like, when do we work with Doug? And then he'd go, who? And we, you know, the guy, with the, you know, the dude. And all that stuff. So, so, we, so we eventually just started calling him Greg Doug. <laughs> now, in recent years, it's become a generic name for anyone that we can't quite remember, or rather, is not a, rem a memorable person. Right, so if we call you Greg Doug, you can either remind us of what your name really is, or smack us because we're being insulted. <laughs> uh, next, uh, Greg Doug. <laughs> Jesus, please. Okay. Um, you were saying that you got your PhD, and you were saying how you did some art stuff since Power Rangers. I know you keep coming back now and then, but what do you do apart from content spare time, oh. work-wise? Uh, uh, currently, I'm a visiting professor of theater at Franklin and Marshall College. Um, Pennsylvania. 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 Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Lancaster, Pennsylvania. With all the Amish. I don't know if you people know about the Amish over here. Yeah. 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 They, yeah. When, when they, when they reupholster a car, they don't put any of the padding back in. It's just wood. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I uh, And normally, uh, when I'm not at Franklin and Marshall, I'm uh, a professor of theater and artistic director at Concordia University of Chicago. Very impressive. And I'm a male model. I'm a plus size male model, the only one. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, back there. You said that you've got no real interest in coming back as like a ranger or anything. In the Japanese Ninja that's coming out, they've just announced that the special ranger is a cowboy with a guitar as a weapon and a cheeseburger as a morpher. Would you be interested in um, if they did an American adaptation of that? Uh, <laughs> I was, Wait a minute! I was Hamlet once. <laughs> I was Hamlet once. That was a running joke. Anytime they had us do something that was so like like demeaning, like they would put us in a dress and then put a, throw a cheeseburger at us, Paul would look at me and be, I was Hamlet once. <laughs> Action! Woo! 
<laughs> but wait, so the Japanese version has, he's a cowboy with a guitar and a hamburger. Yes. yes. Boy, if that is not a racial stereotype of Americans, I don't know what is. <laughs> I think we deserve it, though. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Bring it on. Bring it on. Howdy, y'all. All right, what y'all got to say over here, boy? Uh, if you were able to come back for another season, would you? Well, I mean, it's it's all scheduling, really. And like I said, you know, we, I, said, uh, I in, in particular, am still under contract, so they can reactivate this sleeper cell anytime they want. Um, and I have great relations with the company, and I'm commonly doing business with them in my daily life, so I see them all the time. And, so it's possible for me, it's hard for Jason, because, you know, it's, you can't, it's hard to take a one year sabbatical or a six yeah. month sabbatical to film a show. I mean, that being said, uh, because I am a professor of theater, it might be a possible thing, and it would be something I consider because anytime I get to work with this great dog, um, I, I, I would gladly kill my mother to do it. I love Lenore, please don't. Well, I'm just saying, if you want me to kill, you know, usually for a professor to take like a bunch of time off, he has to have a tenure, and that takes about 10 years to get tenure. Tenure for 10 years. And I don't have that yet. He doesn't have the tenure. He doesn't have the tenure, my friend. Um, I'm super excited to see what they do. Yeah. My personal opinion, and this is purely conjecture, my friends, is that they are going to do the same thing that they did last time with the movies, which is roll the current season into the development for the movie. So what you're likely to see is the penultimate season of Power Rangers, in which the budget has never been higher because they'll be able to, they'll be able to grab some budget from the film and kind of probably piggyback one or the other. So, I mean, but, but who knows, man? I mean, they can call me anytime. Um, you know, just depends if they want us or not. But, I mean, face it, there's like 150 ex-Power Rangers. <laughs> they, they got no time for the so, yeah. The first movie, they didn't even know what to do with us. I mean, they were still asking us to write the script as we're going along. Yeah. And every time we come up with an idea, they'd be like, oh, that's good, keep working on it. Yeah, no. um, the best idea that Jason had about the original Power Rangers movie is that there would be a quarter that we would that accidentally got super glued to the ground, the street, and it was going to be all about us trying to get that quarter. <laughs> Hundreds of ways to get the quarter. Uh, they didn't like the idea, so instead they shot half the storyline of Ivan News, and then we were just kind of there. I, I, yeah, just question, but we're like. The original movies, any stories from the sets or, or from filming the, the, the original two movies? Man, you try again for me because I'm just an American. <laughs> yeah, so have you got any uh, backstage stories from the movies? Oh, 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 dude, tons. I've seen Jason Frank in his underwear so many times, man. <laughs> and, they're, and they're always white. Go figure. Well, you know, actually the camera pulled back. He, he refused to wear pants on the set, so, you know, they always thought it from here up. Is anything down below? You have to be in PG-13 at least. Actually, I should tell you guys this. I just found, I was at my parents' house last week, and I just found the backstage footage from the second Power Ranger movie that Paulie and I were shooting on a little a camcorder. Yeah, I remember the whole Austin's chair thing. It was like a behind the scenes yeah. joke. I yeah. found all the raw footage, so, so, I'll so anyone right so, now. So while we were filming the behind the scenes with a camera crew, Jason had his own personal camera and he was filming. So that's the tape we found. So we're gonna we're gonna dump it, dump it to digital and check it out. It might be humorous. That is good us. A little while ago you mentioned about budgets and obviously Power Rangers in the grand scheme things has always been quite low budget. Sure. Do you think low budgets uh, brings out more invention in you guys as actors and directors and writers and it makes you try harder? Uh, oh, that's a good question. I think, di I think directorially that is absolutely true. And writing wise, I mean actually if you look at historically speaking, if you look at uh, times in which films were the best, like the best acting, best stories, it was because they cut back on special effects and they got better writers. And that's the truth. That's historically speaking. That always happened. Films are not recession proof. They lose the budget. So yes, for sci-fi it's a little more di difficult, although the first Star Wars, some people would argue it's the best, um, it had the lowest budget, so you know, too much money can be a bad thing, actually. For sure, because you start to rely on, you know, it's like the, like the Soviets. You know, the, the Soviets, rather than making a ship that won't sink, they'll just keep making ships. 
you know, it's, just, it's not quite the mentality. There's definitely frugality, frugality would gaps creativity for sure. Yeah. Uh, next. Uh, yeah, that guy. We'll go ahead. Yeah, well, we'll hear you while he's, while he's running over there. If you could take Power Rangers in a new direction, because to me, the modern day Power Rangers is too cookie. Uh, you know, I guess it's always been that way. Yeah, exactly. Have you seen the original Power Rangers? Would you change it anyway? Would you? Because I know you've, if you've both done directing. Well, I, well, I hope that the Lionsgate reboot gives you that dark universe that you all are craving. Yeah, that's what it is. It's about an older demographic. I mean, it's for the kids. It's you know, and so there's a very fine line when you're you dealing with superheroes and action. Or you could just have Bulk and Skull in there. Yeah. You know, to, to, to actually have some actual humor. But you're the, you're the only Bulk and Skull. Oh, God. You've always been the only Bulk and Skull. And you're... Say that again. You've always been the only Bulk and Skull. You hear that? It's going right, right, to, right to his head. Look, he's starting to inflate. <laughs> Look at his nose. It's getting huge. You broke the microphone again. <laughs> you were going to get a spin-off and stuff like that. Has right. there been anyone else? Do you reckon that it could use something like that to... I don't know. You know, sometimes they, sometimes in Power Rangers they have the cast play the humor, right? Yeah. Where, they, where the cast is kind of wacky or whatever. And other times they'll have ancillary characters to introduce humor, or the villains will be humorous in some fashion. I think the humor is important, coming from somewhere, and ideally it's effective. But if not, that's the problem with some of the series, the seasons of Power Rangers, is that that sometimes the actors couldn't quite pull off the humor, yeah. and it just. Like you're kind of you're losing your heroes by making them too bad. Is that wacky. what you would do then? Give <laughs> them yeah. actors, maybe. Or... No, no, no. Say that. Uh, it's just, just you can't have. It's hard to have the heroes be funny. Their yeah. heroes are not supposed to be funny. Idiots are supposed to be funny. Right. right. <laughs> Idiots are supposed to be funny. <laughs> or really, really, really sad. That's Which is why you love idiots, though. <laughs> it's so sad. <laughs> He's broken, like all of us inside. <laughs> the idiot inside, channel the idiot inside. It became really serious and dark in your son. Shut up, shut up. So you got a question? Okay. Back there, back there. Okay. Hey. Um, when you got uh, um, brought behind the bar and doing stuff in the in the jufa, did you ever get um? Um, I was really lucky on the series. The only, so the answer is no, I was never injured while doing Power Rangers. I did stab myself in the leg with a cutlass while doing Shakespeare one summer. <laughs> <laughs> Note to self, don't run down a hill while holding a cutlass. Because it seems like a good idea until this motion and this motion are combined. <laughs> I'm gonna step down here. Oh. I have a nice uh, inch and a half scar on the back of my leg. Thank you, Twelfth Night. <laughs> All right, next. Yep. Uh, hey, this is Rob Polly. What was it like going back into Power Rangers this time? Like, what was it like working with them? <coughs> Oh, no, no, not, not jaded at all. I mean, you know, we're, we were really blessed to be able to play some wonderful characters that have become iconic. And, um, and we're proud, we're proud of it. So it was cool, it was cool to, to reprise the role. <coughs> I particularly like the pilot episode of Samurai, um, <clears throat> in which I uh, tell Spike about the way of the Samurai. It's a really cute scene, and I think it kind of like was a great encapsulation of the character. Next. Uh, oh, right. Actually, about out of time, I've got just one, one more. It's you, brother. I, I just wanted to ask about Tweet, actually. Um, I wanted to know, um, did you get to see her a lot after she left the show? And do you think she knew about like, the legacy she left? Well, um, certainly she was, not, she was not unaware of the legacy of the show because it, the show was number one worldwide within 14 seconds. You know, of its era. It was immediately a worldwide smash hit. So we all we all knew that we were part of something really special. Yeah, and I mean at that point it wasn't a legacy yet. It was a it was a giant hit. We all assumed there would be a legacy. I don't know that anyone could have guessed how long it would be, but I mean we knew she was part of something special. Absolutely. She didn't get to see it. No, not not very much. No. No, because you know, she was really pursuing her career full steam. She was working all the time, so 
No, we, we didn't. I, I think Amy Joe stayed close with her and David. Yeah, and I didn't really see anyone for a number of years, like none of them. Even you, you were going to college, man. I was like, you're, the one, you're the one that called me about, uh, and told me about Chewy, actually, so. Well, that was a little bit thanks. <laughs> we missed Chewy, she was a lovely, lovely woman. She sure was, smart lady. Smart, sweet as hell. Way smarter than us. Yeah. So, all right. I think okay, we're gonna keep up. We got, oh, hey, you guys, thanks for coming and listening to all of our bad, 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 b